My friends, it's with great joy that I speak about what is commonly called the crowning of Marian devotion, that being Marian consecration. And to get at the heart of what this consecration is, we quote from the devotion's greatest historic champion, not the only historic champion, but certainly the greatest historic champion, St. Louis Marie de Montfort, from his classic work, True Devotion, where he says, and I quote, This devotion consists, then, in giving ourselves entirely to the Blessed Virgin in order to belong entirely to Jesus Christ through her. So what is Marian consecration? Marian consecration is an unconditional gift of self to Our Lady. Self-donation in the expressions of St. John Paul II in the Theology of the Body. You're giving yourself entirely to Mary for the purpose of Our Lady, as the Mediatrix of all graces, to use the full power of her intercession to keep you true to the baptismal promises of Jesus Christ, and thereby the adage, you know, to Jesus through Mary. So the end, the goal, is intimacy with Jesus, holiness in light of Jesus, a, a greater living of one bapti one's baptismal promises to Jesus, which Origen, the 3rd century uh, Christian writer, said, you can summarize all of Christian life by being true to your baptismal promises. It's what we have incorporated in the creed. So we have option A, to try to do that without Mary's help, or option B, to do it with a full-blown intercession of the Mediatrix of all graces. Option B makes a lot more sense, and that's why Marian consecration makes a lot more sense. That's why popes and saints and mystics have all invited us to consecrate ourselves to Mary. Now, in terms of even the origin of that word uh, consecration, anathemonoi in Greek, it means to set aside for a sacred use. And that's really what we're doing. We're giving ourselves to the mother so that she can use us and the value of our good works for whatever is most important and most needed in the mystical body of Christ. It's, it's, an, it's an incredible tapping in to a vantage point that simply cannot be compared to our vantage point. That is, someone who is aware of the spiritual needs and state of seven billion souls. That's the mother of God. And by, as we'll talk about, by our giving our, the value of our good works to her, she can use those good works uh, for the greatest possible salvation of souls, and at the same time, beautifully and remarkably, for our own personal salvation and sanctification. Historically, where does Marian consecration start? It certainly does not start with St. Louis Marie de Montfort. In fact, by the 4th and 5th centuries, we have a number of African sermons that talk about becoming a servus Mariae, that is, a slave of Mary, a slave of the Mother of God. And the context was, uh, in a secondary sense, similar to St. Paul saying, I am a slave of Jesus Christ. Well, to become the slave of the handmaid of the Lord is not only still directed to the Lord, but it's also a submission of obedience to the handmaid. And so what you're having here is a, is a, a beautiful context of how we most fully give ourselves to Jesus while uh, being disposed to the graces and to the intercession of Mary. Now, by the 8th century, we have people like St. John Damascene in the East, who fundamentally authors a prayer of consecration. And I should note, you know, this idea of slavery. Some people say, I don't like slavery. You know, it's got a bad connotation. Civil War, Africa, let's, let's get away from that. Remember, the concept of slavery is biblical. Uh, in Philippians 2, uh, 5 through 11, the, can the, the canonical of kenosis, uh, Jesus takes on the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of men. Again, St. Paul talks about himself as a, as a slave of Jesus Christ. The key note here, my friends, is that it's voluntary slavery. And as applied to Mary, we're, we're freely giving ourselves to Mary, as de Montfort will articulate, as a slave, so that we can be fully at the service of Jesus Christ. So listen to this uh, 8th century consecration prayer. This is by St. John Damascene, again, who dies in 749. Listen to the depth of this prayer of consecration to Our Lady back in the 8th century. St. John Damascene tells us, O Lady, before you we take our stand. Lady, I call you Virgin Mother of God, and to your hope, as to the surest and strongest anchor, we bind ourselves. To you we consecrate our mind, our soul, our body, all that we are. Mind, soul, body, all that we are. That's total consecration. 
And remember, my friends, when we're talking about an authentic marrying consecration, it has to have uh, two elements. One is that it is a, a gift of oneself entirely to Our Lady. So the to Jesus through Mary formula can never be taken that we don't actually give ourselves directly to Mary. We do, because she's mediatrix of all graces. She can receive that gift and she can uh, dispense the grace to unite us to the heart of Jesus in ways we simply cannot do on our own. Secondly, again, authentic Marian consecration always has a Christological end to it, a greater intimacy of Jesus and in the formulas of uh, St. Louis Marie de Montfort and St. Maximilian Colby, for example, uh, a living of our baptismal promises. Well, listen to this 7th century Marian consecration form by St. Ildefonsus of Toledo. St. Ildefonsus uh, dies in 669 uh, as a, a prominent Western Mariology, uh, Mar Mariologist out of Spain. And listen to, again, the nature of this giving ourselves to uh, Mary as a slave to the handmaid of the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, and I quote, Therefore, he's talking to Our Lady, Therefore I am your servant, because your son is my Lord. Therefore you are my Lady, because you are the handmaid of my Lord. Therefore I am the servant of the handmaid of my Lord, because you, my Lady, have become the mother of my Lord. So, a slave to the slave of Jesus, a servant to the handmaid. Uh, it almost sounds like a Mariological who's on first going through that quote of Ildefonsus of Toledo. But the point is clear. When you become a slave to the handmaid of the Lord, it's all to the service of the Lord, but with that special intimacy with the handmaid as well, that special grace of unity of heart with Our Lady. Now, several popes have also proclaimed themselves to be slaves of the Mother of God. Uh, we have Pope John VII as early as the 8th century, uh, Pope Nicholas the 14th in the 13th century, and Pope Paul V in the 17th century. We also have these great scholastic theologians. Saint Anselm referred to himself as slave of the Mother of God. Saint Bernard of Clairvaux uh, speaks about giving all to Mary. Uh, Bernard tells us, quote, Whatever you are about to offer, remember to commend it to Mary so that through the same channel whence grace flowed, it may return to the giver of grace. So, by the 16th and 17th century, there's, there's already a, a nice foundation for Marian consecration. Then, St. Louis Marie de Montfort takes on the historic scene, and he is rightly called the champion, because even though there was certainly the presence of Marian consecration, you have the preaching of de Montfort, uh, which then becomes the context contents of the book, True Devotion to Mary. And then you have the climax of the actual consecration, which we'll examine, the two paragraphs, where essentially you give to Our Lady all that you are, body, soul, goods, interior, exterior, even the value of all your good actions, again for the sake of baptismal promises. So you'll see with both St. Louis Marina Montfort and with St. Maximilian Kolbe, a great missionary zeal of bringing souls back to Christ through Our Lady. Now, uh, do yourself a favor, uh, read, a, read a good biography of St. Louis Marie de Montfort because he was a, a, one of the extraordinary saints. He dies uh, very young, uh, at 43. Uh, he is uh, a man of, of not only great integrity, but a great uh, penance uh, and, a, and, a, and a purity of heart for Our Lady. The actual text of True Devotion isn't found uh, until 100 plus years after the death of de Montfort. It's found in a case, some feared that perhaps during the French Revolution they were trying to say all Catholic writings, which, uh, because so many were subject to being burned. But soon before his beatification, this text is found. Well, True Devotion to Mary is one of the most papally indulgence books of all time. And the Holy Fathers, for example, St. Pius X offers a plenary indulgence in perpetuum for those who will read the book and make the consecration. So the Holy Fathers are really encouraging this. They're not going to force it. It's not going to become an eighth sacrament but they're doing all they can. And of course, this is in a special way manifest in the life and the teaching and the motto of St. John Paul II, totus tuus, uh, from the first two words of the Marian consecration of St. Louis Marie de Montfort. Totus tuus ego sum, et omnia, uh, in the process of uh, uh, the, the totus tuus, I am entirely yours, but it is directly to Mary. Totus tuus ego sum, I am entirely yours, and it's, it's directed to the mother. Uh, there's been some commentary saying, well, no, that, that prayer actually ends in 
the consecration is specific to Jesus. No, the Monfort's consecration is uh, Overgo, uh, Overgo Maria is the end of the Latin formulation, so it's directly to Our Lady, which fits the foundations for consecration. Listen in number 120 to de Montfort's descri uh, description and kind of foundation for consecration. He will say, and I quote, All our perfection consists in being conformed, united, and consecrated to Jesus Christ. And therefore, the most perfect of all devotions is, without any doubt, that which the most perfectly conforms, unites, and consecrates us to Jesus Christ. Now, Mary, being the most conform of all creatures to Jesus Christ, it follows that of all devotions, that which most consecrates and conforms the soul to our Lord is devotion to his Holy Mother. And that the more soul is consecrated to Mary, the more it is consecrated to Jesus. Hence it comes to pass that the most perfect consecration to Jesus Christ is nothing else than a perfect and entire consecration of ourselves to the Blessed Virgin. And this is the devotion that I teach, or in other words, a perfect renewal of the vows of baptism. So, once again, the goal is perfect union with Jesus through a total gift and, and conforming of ourselves to Our Lady. Now, I want to go to the two key paragraphs of consecration. Uh, they're the paragraphs which start with I and then one puts their name in, a faithless sinner. But before we go to the act of consecration, let's keep in mind that for all authentic Marian devotions, there simply must be a foundation in theology, in doctrine, in truth. So proper love of Mary must be based on the truth about her. So what is the theological foundation for the act of Marian consecration? It is none other than Mary as the mediatrix of all graces. This gives her both the capacity to receive us, to receive a filial gift, a son or daughter-like gift from humanity, being our spiritual mother. Secondly, and most importantly, she can distribute the graces to fulfill the purpose of the consecration, which is a greater living uh, fidelity to the baptismal promises of Jesus. So, let's go over these two paragraphs. And you're going to see that they're a combination of really a mini exorcism and a total gift to Our Lady. The first paragraph, I, and then one's name, a faithless sinner, renew and ratify today in your hands, O Immaculate Mother, the vows of my baptism. I renounce forever Satan, his pomps and works. I give myself entirely to Jesus Christ, the incarnate wisdom, to carry my cross after him all the days of my life, and to be more faithful to him than I have ever been before. Okay, so paragraph one, once again, you're renouncing Satan, you're taking on Jesus Christ, and you're vowing to take the cross to live the cross of Jesus like never before. That's pretty Christological. Okay, that, that's, that's pretty uh, no-lose there. Paragraph 2, In the presence of all the heavenly court, I choose you this day for my mother and queen, or mistress. Uh, mistress meaning the female version of master, the medieval concept of the, the, the dominus and the domina, right? The master and the mistress of the castle, of the manor. So it's a royal concept. I deliver and consecrate to you as your slave my body and soul, my goods, both interior and exterior, and even the value of all my good actions, past, present, and future, leaving to you the entire and full right of disposing of me and all that belongs to me, without exception, according to your good pleasure, for the greater glory of God in time and eternity. Amen. So, let's look at the second part of the paragraph. This is really the heart of the consecration. Now we give ourselves directly to the Blessed Mother as a gift. What do we give her? Our body, our soul, our goods, interior and exterior, and the value of all our good works, past, present, and future. That's an entirety of a self-gift. Uh, now, some, and I, and I want to deal with this in terms of some, some objections that are raised, understandable objections, uh, not substantial uh, objections, but, but understandable, on well, isn't there some danger in doing this? I mean, okay, so what we're doing in part two is we're giving ourselves entirely to our Blessed Mother, body, soul, all of our, 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 our good works, past, present, and future. So one understandable objection is, well, if I'm giving all my merits, all the value of my good works to our Blessed Mother to distribute as she wills, what about me? And St. Louis uh, responds to this by essentially saying, 
it is always meritorious to give away merit. See, my friends, you, you simply can't outdo God in generosity. And so when we give away our merits, we get exponentially more merits, uh, the value of good works, because again, this is the principle of infinite generosity by God. God wants us to be concerned about the salvation of others as co-redeemers. And so when we give our merits away, we can be sure that we will only get more. And then, wow, well, what if we give those away? Same principle operates, my friends. Uh, to, to give away merit is always a meritorious act. Well, the second objection could be, well, okay, you know, so I'll get more merits, but what about the needs of the people in my life? What about the uh, areas of my life that I should be offering merits and offering good works for? Uh, children or, or, or spouses or, or, or parents or friends. If I give it to Our Lady, how do I know the responsibilities of my vocation in life will be satisfied? Well, St. Louis responds properly that it is Our Lady, it is the Mother of Jesus, who will first and best distribute your merits for your vocation in life. It will be her, she in the first sense. It will be she who will lead us to uh, fulfill the obligations according to our God-given states in life. So there's not a worry that Our Lady is going to take our merits and not apply them to our needy spouse or children or friends. Uh, quite the contrary. If we were to forget or if we were to have things out of order uh, of who needs more prayers or more merits at a given time, Our Lady will make that correction because she is the Mediatrix of all graces. And once again, she has this extraordinary ability to know the state of seven billion souls right now and who is in greatest need. And this can lead us to the third issue, and that is, well, if, and, and perhaps not so much as an objection, but, but the idea, let's say that you want to distribute the value of your good works. That you really think you have a, a, a better take on how to do that. Well, how many people would you know? Let's say you're very popular. Uh, let's say you know 500 people or 1,000. Let's make it 5,000. You have a personal relationship, 5,000 uh, people. That's rather remarkable. Well, Our Lady, once again, knows 7 billion people. And I would say, if Our Lady, and, and please don't take this out of context, I'm just using it for the sake of example, if Our Lady were to appear to you and say, look, the sufferings you endured these last couple of weeks, which was so painful, uh, I would like to apply that to 10,000 souls who are going to die uh, in this next week without a special grace, uh, and they'll die in the state of serious sin, uh, in, in rejection of God, but because of your merits, I can apply them graces which will save them, which at least bring them into purgatory. Do I have your permission to do so? Well, who of us would dare, especially in the middle of a Marian apparition, say, no, I, I think, Blessed Mother, I think I'll handle my own merits. Of course we would say yes. Now, don't expect an apparition, and we shouldn't expect an apparition. That's part of the faith and trust and obedience that comes with Marian consecration. But surely we would have that sense of charity in our heart that if someone were to die in, in, in the far off uh, lands of, uh, uh, of the South Pacific and uh, before the end of this lecture, and you had made a sacrifice this morning, a prayer, a, a rosary, a uh, Holy Communion, endured a, a, a difficult insult, and you offered it to Our Lady, and she could apply it to the soul and save their soul uh, because of your merits? Who could, who could dare say that there's something thought, uh, you know, wrong or incorrect with that? So we must never, so the point is we must, must never put our understanding of spiritual needs above Our Lady's understanding of spiritual needs. So on all these counts, Marian consecration is a win-win. There's simply no loss. Because, again, not only is Our Lady freed now, and when I say freed, remember, I'm talking about in the order of human freedom. God the Father will not allow forcing of grace. When you make a marrying consecration, you're saying to Our Lady, I do want your full intercession for me, for my sanctification, for my life. So, not only does marrying consecration give us that grace, but it also, once again, allows us to be co-redeemers in Christ. It allows her to distribute the merits of grace so, conceivably, you could be in heaven, God willing, we make it, and someone walks up and says, you know, I'm in heaven because of Jesus and because of Mary and because of you. 
And you say, well, what do you mean? Well, maybe you wouldn't say what you mean. You'd have the beatific vision up there, but just go with the expression here. Go with the example. Once again, uh, well, because of that great suffering you endured and you offered it to Our Lady, she applied it to me at the moment of my death. It gave me the grace to say yes to God at the moment of my death, and therefore I'm here because of Jesus the Redeemer, Mary the Co-Redemptrix, and you. What a, what, a, what a beautiful thing to participate in, and it's possible uh, when we participate in these areas of grace. So, in our next lecture, we're going to talk a little bit more about Marian consecration on the global front, uh, and also we're going to talk about the scapular devotion, because the scapular devotion is in many ways a first cousin devotion to Marian consecration. Uh, but here I want us to really anchor on personal consecration, why it is so valuable, why the popes call us to do it, and why I invite you to do it. It's something that surely, surely you will never regret. Thank you.